My name is Catherine Rooney Vera. I'm Chief Market Strategist at StoneX, a Fortune 100 firm with 4,500 employees and 80 offices worldwide. And today I am very excited to have this fabulous panel of experts. Constance Hunter, Senior Advisor at Macro Policy Perspectives, uh, formerly at AIG and KPMG as Chief Economist at both. Thank you for joining. Actually, it's, I, was, I was Global Head of Strategy at AIG. OK. <laughs> Jose Torres, Head of Economics, uh, Interactive Brokers, Adjunct Professor at the City University of New York. Thank you for joining us. And Steve Mirren, Adjunct Fellow at Manhattan Institute and former Senior Advisor for Economic Policy at Treasury. Market economist, um, similar to me. Uh, in the investing industry for about 14 years, on the buy side, principally with hedge funds and asset management. So the way I thought I'd, we'd kick off this panel, which is principally focused on Latin America, is by setting the scene on the global macro front. And there's no better place to start, in my view, than with the main driver of global growth, which is the US and China. So this morning, we got some blowout economic or uh, employment numbers from the US economy. We saw more than 330,000 jobs generated in the US economy. Fourth quarter growth came at 3.3% quarter over quarter, seasonally adjusted annualized, with GDP deflator decelerating, which means, in combination with high productivity, that we are lodged de facto in this magnificent Goldilocks economy of immaculate disinflation combined with robust economic growth. So, question. Let's start with you, Constance. All right. Is this immaculate disinflation in the context that I just discussed with robust economic growth, remarkably strong labor market, is immaculate disinflation continuity into 2024 a fairy tale or a new normal? So I don't love the term immaculate disinflation, but it is true that prices came down while we didn't see unemployment rise, right? And the question is, are we going to see unemployment? What's going to happen to the labor market in 2024? Um, what is going to happen to inflation in 2024? And as you said, the linchpin of how this outcome manifests rests on productivity, right? So. Um, I have been studying productivity in depth for about 30 years, and I will say that economists do not fully understand productivity. So I'm going to give you an example. In 1965, there was a, a time uh, cover, and um, it was uh, President Johnson had convened a commission to study productivity. Can you guess what they were studying? They were studying this problem that we had too much productivity and were we not going to have any more jobs? Was the US economy going to fall apart? We had too much productivity. How do we, how do we reduce productivity? Well, he convened this, this group of economists to study how we were going to reduce productivity. So productivity is what economists call the magic elixir. And it really is. I mean, it really is incredible. It's why you're seeing so many company earnings come out and saying, we're going to have good guidance for, for 2024. Um, and it's, it's rippling through the entire economy. Um, I wrote a paper in 2020, actually the end of 2020, that was sort of an overview of what we know about productivity. And what's interesting about recessions is that um, people work harder during recessions. So if, if you're in a company that lays off a lot of people and you remain, you work harder during recessions. Does, any, does anyone, who feels that that's their lived experience, right? You work harder during a recession. Right, you're still at a company. There's a lot of pressure. Maybe you've laid off some people. If you have a job, you're working harder during a recession, and that yields some productivity gains. What we have also seen in the U.S. economy, which is remarkable, is starting during COVID, we had a really significant increase in what we call high propensity business formations. So these are companies that have been started with social security numbers to hire people, right? So they, they plan to hire employees. So it's not just, you know, somebody setting out a shingle in their garage and I'm going to be a consultant, right? These are companies that are employing people. And we saw this remarkable rise above previous records, so way above the pre-global financial crisis level. And that level of increase in high propensity business formations has continued. It is across all sectors. And what's remarkable about this is when you, 
is diffusion of technology is always sort of the bugbear for, um, for productivity gains. So we saw very little diffusion of technology actually in the, in the knots in the 2010s. Um, and when you have new businesses, they're not encumbered by legacy technology. They can start fresh with new technology. The other thing that we see when we see these tech layoffs, there are, every firm is a tech firm now. There's no firm in the world that exists without using technology. At the basic level, you're using email, right? But, but you're probably using contact management and a client relation management system. Um, you're using the data from that system that every business in the world is run on data now. I don't care what kind of business you are. And so when these tech firms lay people off, they also diffuse throughout the economy. There's huge demand for them. And so it's why we're seeing job gains at these levels. Today we saw professional and business services, which had lagged, um, increase 70,000. We saw the diffusion index, which says what percentage of companies are adding workers. <coughs> Over 60% of companies are adding workers. So the question is, what happens to inflation in this mm -hmm. situation? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that you, you can actually sustain a higher level of growth when you have higher productivity. So if we, what you want to look at is like a four quarter moving average. So at a four quarter moving average, we're running at about two and a half percent. Do I think we're going to sustain that for the next five years or for the decade? Probably not. If we could, if we could sustain 2.2 percent, that is a huge increase from what we have done over the previous 10 years of 1.5 percent. We don't need, you know, Infl uh, productivity to stay at 3% to have a remarkable, remarkable decade. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, so if that's the case and we are seeing economic growth, that's double potential, with potential being about 1.8%. Mm, yeah, it wouldn't be double. So you take potential up to maybe 2.2, 2.3. Yeah. Okay. Well, the the Fed has 1.8, but but it, it's debatable. There's a range there. But let's say it potential is 1.8 percent, and we're growing at above three. Um, where does the Fed go with that? Like, does the Fed have a strict or loose interpretation of its two percent target, and can they really drop rates with the economy as boom as it is, without risking? The worst possible scenario, in my opinion, which is cutting prematurely, then having to resume hikes, which in my view as a market economist would devastate the rates market, equities, and risk assets in general, principally in emerging markets. And I know we're focused on Latin America here. So as goes the US, US economic growth robust. If inflation continues to drop, uh, dollar weakens, Fed cuts, that's fabulous for Latin America. But let's consider the alternative as well. Yeah, so thanks. That's a that's a great question. Um, the the first part of it, how does the Fed construe its employment? Sorry, its inflation mandate. And I would say pretty flexibly. I mean, they've mm -hmm. shown over and over that they're willing to change their interpretation of the mandate when it suits their needs. And so, you know, it transforms from a two percent, you know, from from no target, from price stability to a two percent target to a symmetric two percent target to flexible average inflation targeting, right. where we're no longer going to let bygones be bygones and make up for past shortfalls or overshoots. To that's asymmetric, and we're only going to make up for past shortfalls. To focusing on core on core PCE, to focusing on services, to focusing mm -hmm. on services less housing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and whatever the latest iteration is. So the Fed will choose its policy goal based on what it wants to achieve in the economy and then find the data and the and the framework to justify its actions. I think that's what this Fed has done over and over and what it'll continue doing. Um, and if the Fed wants to cut because core PCE as measured has been running close to its target for six months plus now, uh, then they'll, you know, they'll cut and they'll go ahead and do that. And I think you raised a, a fabulous concern, which is that, you know, if the Fed is right that measured PCE inflation really corresponds to inflation as it's experienced in the economy, to underlying inflation, to what really matters for households when they think about stable prices, then yeah, you know, just cutting based on core PCE is the right move completely, right? But if underlying inflation is actually different than core PCE as we measure it, because it includes things that are different than how statisticians compiled the PCE data, if maybe it's closer to CPI or maybe it's closer to where wages are growing, uh, you know, then it's a, it's a significant risk. And so you know, as I see things, I see labor markets that are you know, a little bit softer than they were last year this time, but are still by and large fairly tight. I see housing markets that are extremely tight. 
And you know, if the Fed accelerates the economy by cutting rates a lot, and then we get a resurgence in inflation, it would be a pretty bad outcome. And from my perspective, a lot of it hinges on what Constance was talking about, which is the outlook for productivity. You know, we've benefited from significant productivity growth over the last year. Uh, you know, the question is, what was driving that? Right? Mm -hmm. Was that being driven by by supply by negative supply shocks earlier in the cycle unwinding by the supply chains becoming untangled and by oil coming down or was it driven by genuine enhancements in how firms utilize their labor resources mm -hmm. right and the answer to that question will will generate a lot of uh disagreeing views over whether or not the productivity growth that we've seen is sustainable i'm a little bit less optimistic than Constance is because I think that the untangling of the negative supply shocks played a huge role in productivity growth, particularly lower oil prices, right? But also because I think the regulatory environment matters enormously. The regulatory environment is, I think, the single most important determinant of economic growth that is underappreciated by economists, in large part because it's so difficult to measure, right? You can look at a tax rate, you can look at a deficit, and you have a number. And economists like being quantitative because it makes them feel like they're physicists. The regulatory environment is much more complicated, right? It's very heterogeneous. There's lots of products. There's lots of categories. It's difficult to measure. And when you have a government that's increasing the regulatory burdens on firms, I think it goes to constrain the supply side and generate upwards pressure on inflation and have trouble growing productivity growth. Uh, and so deregulation versus regulation, I think, is an absolutely critical determinant of the productivity environment. And I'm not really heartened by what I see. Let's move to Latin America. Uh, Mexico has been in a boom cycle, and that shouldn't shock us since 80% of, of the uh, Mexican economy really is tied to, to the US economy. Um, so we saw Mexican growth um, remarkably strong, also uh, above 3% in the, in the latest data. Um, inflation has been trending down. Um, Mexico, like every central bank in, in, in Latin America, did their homework and hiked rates when they should have, when probably the Fed should have, with Brazil principally uh, hiking over 1,000 basis points and effectively curbing completely inflation. Um, these Latin American central banks are now able to cut rates effectively to shore up their economy um, because inflation has been abated. And that's been um, a credit to Latin America. So Mexico. Mexico is growing at a substantial clip, way above their potential. Uh, Mexico has had a historical uh, trend growth of 1%, and they're growing at three times that, um, with inflation decelerating. I was in Monterrey, uh, Mexico, two months ago, speaking at an event not dissimilar to this one, um, but in Spanish. And, um, and, and you can sense, you can really feel the nearshoring effect. So it's, it's this Mexico moment, which I think you, Jose, like I have worked in emerging markets for more than two decades. Um, Mexico moment has been a recurring theme that has consistently disappointed. So I had my own doubts about the Mexico moment until I went to Monterey and saw it from my own eyes. My question for you is, how sustainable is that? Well, I think that it is sustainable. Following the pandemic, the U.S. has tried to decouple from China, uh, choosing reliability over profitability. Mexico is a more expensive option than China, but it's closer and it's more reliable. Last year's inflation, disinflation rather, occurred mainly because goods prices and commodity prices came down. And emerging markets, specifically in Latin America, they're more sensitive to commodities and goods than services. Here in the US, most of our inflation is driven by services, which are labor intensive. This morning's report, average hourly earnings grew 0.6%, the fastest rate since March of 2022, so 22 months ago. Job growth is also really fast. So I think for inflation to go right this year, I think commodities and goods inflation already bottomed. I think there's a higher likelihood that those prices start to tick higher when we look at what's happening with geopolitical tensions around the world and supply chains starting to be disrupted again, not to the extent of COVID, but to a lesser degree. And also oil prices 
trading near small producer break evens, I see a floor there as well. So I think that uh, Latin American economies are cutting rates, but there is a risk that uh, inflation does flare back up. I think uh, what the Fed is doing here in the U.S. Is, is a smart move to stay restrictive. And I think a clue is whenever Fed Chief Powell comes out and talks a little dovish and gives the market a little bit of what they want, which of course is more liquidity and a hint of rate cuts, you know, markets fly, bond yields tumble. And that's before a rate cut or before any monetary policy e easing even occurs, right? So what would actually happen if the Fed started to uh, cut rates? And to um, Constance and Steve's earlier points, uh, a big grave error would be to cut, have inflation shoot back up, and then have to hike again, right? That would be really bad for corporate America. But uh, overall, I think Mexico is a, a sustainable growth trajectory uh, just because they're so close and they're much more reliable than uh, China, which we're having some um, you know, significant geopolitical tensions with, with the Trump administration, you know, uh, things really became sour. But then with the Biden administration, you know, we, some folks expected that with the Biden administration, uh, the U.S. would be a little softer on China. Biden has actually been, you know, arguably more tough on China than, than President Trump was. What's the next shoe to drop? Steve, I'll, I'll go to you on this. And, and I think this question is pertin pertinent from the perspective of we've had more than a decade of uh, zero interest rate policy. We've seen the Fed increase its balance sheet to 30% of GDP, um, marginally take it down, but, but insignificant in, in the magnitude. One would expect that unwinding that inordinate amount of, of policy loosening, there would be repercussions. We saw one with SVP. Um, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, we have not yet seen what, what is intuitively the next phase, which is a credit cycle. We have not seen that. My perspective is that that is because that corporates, similar to we homeowners, have refinanced their obligations, putting out their, pushing out their maturity wall. How many of us have mortgage rates below 6%? Um, the, the answer uh, mathematically is 92% of us. Two thirds of us have lower than four percent, so so we have been shielded from these hikes in the Fed funds, 525 basis points over a little bit more than one year. Similar to that, in my view, has been corporate America, especially um, uh, uh, leveraged loans. Leveraged loans are high risk, variable rate loans. We have not seen defaults there. We've not seen defaults on high yield. What is going on? When is the, what is the next shoe to drop? What are the risks on the horizon from an unwinding of, of, of policy we have never seen before? So that's a great question, and, and I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you. I, don't, I, you know, I, I can't tell you it's this industry or that industry or this sector or that sector, but you know, corporate America, households, all borrowers, except for the federal government, did a really good job locking in low interest rates when they were available. Right. And so as you point out, you know, most mortgage holders, sorry, most mortgage debtors have more, you know, are paying interest rates significantly less than the current market rate, which is what, close to 7% almost, is six and a half, seven percent 7%, Brett? Right. I'm going to come down to 5.7. Oh, come, okay. Come down since I looked at it. Um, you know, so mortgage rates have come down a lot, um, you know, but most people are still paying significantly below that, right? And most corporates that borrowed locked in much lower rates, uh, you know, a number of years ago. And so when you look at the actual coupon payments on, you know, the aggregate bond indices, they're significantly below the yield because folks locked Locked in lower payments, and so as those mature, as the, as those loans start rolling over, people will get locked into more expensive loans, right? Whether that's corporates or households or anybody else, and so gradually, bit by bit, over the next couple of years, this will be happening. But it's hard for me to look at the data that are out there now and sort of say I know exactly what sector is going to be. I, you know, I, I don't. My crystal ball isn't isn't clear enough for that. Um, but you know, over time, I still do believe these monetary policy lags exist, and they will eventually come to get us. Now, the problem is how high is inflation in the meantime until they come to get us, and what is the economy doing in the meantime until they come to get us? And that's when you run the risk of sort of you know re reigniting inflation and 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 you know sort of getting those uh, higher inflation expectations increasingly embedded into psychology. 
Um, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a, a, a great answer for you. Well, many had discussed the yeah. banking system. So I don't know, Constance, if you want to talk about any risks of the banking system, whether it be from exposure to CRE, commercial real estate, whether it be to, um, to banks that have an asset liability match. Do you see any threat to the, to the financial system in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take it out 30,000 feet. So we have uh, Japan, which... Um, has their central bank balance sheet as a percent of GDP is 74%. US is 27. EU is about 30, 33. And Canada is about uh, 22. Okay. So Japan is the third largest economy in the world. They've had zero interest rates for a very long time. Um, anybody who had, was in markets in the 90s remembers uh, or the like the widowmaker trade where you shorted JGBs and said they can't keep rates this low for this long um, and so uh, that was not a winning trade generally speaking but we are now finally at the point where you're starting to see Japan's 10-year yield tick up the 30-year yield which they don't control has ticked up a bit more Whenever you have divergent central bank policy among major central banks, it causes volatility through markets, right? I think that 2024 is going to be a year of a good economy and very, very volatile capital markets. And when you have volatile capital markets, you have the potential for things to ripple, right? And so, like Steve said, it's you can't say exactly where, but I would just see, be very attuned to volatility, be very hedged against volatility, or if you're so inclined, make that volatility your friend and see the opportunities. But I, I would submit to you that 2024 is going to be a year of significant volatility. Interesting. Thank you, Constance. And at Stonex, one of the ideas, and I agree with um, with Constance, we, I, we just published our outlook two days ago, and, and the principal thesis therein was to protect your risk exposure. Because the most likely scenario, given the robustness of the labor market, is for the economy to maintain a steady pace and not fall into recession this year. And if that's the case, um, then you do want to maintain exposure to risk assets. But right now, given where the, the volatility index is being so low and the complacency and euphoria in the markets, it's a great idea to buy options to protect yourself, whether that be put options for 4.5% that cover you for 12 months, or whether it be the purchase of CDS, credit default swaps, and high yield. The point here is it's very judicious, in my, in my view, to put on defensive hedges when the market is very toppy. I would just add, there's a great new ETF that uh, goes long bond market volatility, mm. right? So, so there's a lot of ways to play this. Right. Thank you. Um, Jose, um, going, going back to you. Um, so if there is a lot of volatility, as we're just discussing in the markets, where does that leave emerging markets? And I ask you because the setup is strong, but the volatility if that does occur is negative, And then you get this effect of sudden stop. So inherent volatility can mean you know, volatile capital flows to these emerging spaces. Can the difference in growth, which favors emerging markets, specifically Latin America, can the divergence in interest rate policy compensate for the potential volatility in the pipeline as res with respect to emerging markets investing? Well, yes, to an extent, because if the Fed is going to stay restrictive, more restrictive relative to Latin American counterparts, then you know that strengthens the import-export dynamics for Latin America. Uh, one thing about volatility that I want to talk about real quick is uh, we've seen the volatility index really plunge, and we see all these events around the world and all these different things occurring, and somehow hedging is so cheap nowadays. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is volatility has really turned into an asset class. And so many portfolios now are using selling calls against long, selling puts against shorts, or just selling puts just for fun with zero data, <laughs> just, for fun. just for fun with zero data uh, expiry options. You know, if I sell these amount of puts, all I got to do is survive till 4, 4 o'clock, 4.15 technically, and then, you know, I'm doing fine. But the issue is, and we've seen this so many times in financial history, is what happens to crowded trades, right? 2018, we saw 
a burst in volatility in, in December. The market went down 20% in a month. You know, So um, I'm expecting, while we haven't seen the volatility, I do agree with my fellow panelists here today, we are going to see a spike in volatility at some point. And um, if I were to guess with the crystal ball what, where that volatility will come from, it's going to come from regional banks and commercial real estate exposure. Um, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that regional banks had trouble they were reaching for yield back in 2021 when there were really no not much opportunities uh they bought a lot of long long duration bonds that's weighing on them uh this fed meeting that just passed by the way the statement actually omitted a sentence from the previous statement that said the banking system is sound and resilient right mm -hmm. so that can mm -hmm. serve as a clue that I agree. Maybe the banking sector isn't sound and resilient. <laughs> oh, no, they took that out because they don't think it's necessary to highlight it anymore. Now, they may be wrong, but they think it's... And, and I have to say, we have a lot of clients who are mid-sized banks. And the way that they, they plan for this on their balance sheet, so from a cash flow perspective, yes, they're taking... You know, if you, they were to sell their, their funds right now, they're taking a mark-to-market loss. The way this manifests, though, is that you see them holding more cash and not lending out as much money, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it serves to, it's, it's part of this, you talk about the transmission mechanism being um, less robust because so many people have fixed rate mortgages, but it's, it's actually more robust when you think about commercial bank loans. And so, yes, large firms were able to refinance, um, but small medium sized firms really rely on their local banks for financing yes. and those banks are less inclined to lend because they need to hold more cash on the balance sheet because of these point. losses that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go under like an SVB or um you know uh uh what was the bank not the recent oh, bank in new york yeah. but one of the new york banks um, that went under uh, signature. signature yes yeah. um but but so it's the, I think where it manifests is how it how it works for monetary policy transmission, awesome. which is significant. I want to get in a really important question because we haven't touched China. We got to touch China, and then I have a question for you, Steve. And I think that's all the time we have. Um, but thank you for that. And you're right, Constance, because uh, we have a presentation wh where we look at the percentage of banks in America, large or small, that are tightening lending standards. It rose to 50 percent. Okay, it's dropped, which is great, to 45 percent. But a little under half of all banks are tightening lending standards. And that historically, that, that level historically, um, is it, it comes in parallel with recession. This, could, this time could be different. And it likely is with, with the labor market where it's at. But let's move on because we have limited time. 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Yes, uh, the, the we bank, have five minutes. The bank term funding program, a lot of regional banks were expecting that to get extended. Oh yeah. It's ending not, March 11th. Not gonna be extended. And you know, expect, they were also expecting a rate cut to come in March. That got incrementally delayed to May. After today's payroll report, you can delay. You can argue that maybe the first cut is in June. Yep, very good. Thank you, Jose. Um, let's move on to. All right, I got to get this question in for you, Steve. Does the U.S. national debt matter? Say we go from thirty trillion to fifty or eighty trillion. Okay, say we do that. We can all say that's unsustainable, but is it? Um, What's the trigger that makes it unsustainable if the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury remain dominant? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, no, it's absolutely not sustainable. And, you know, the problems are starting to come into the come into focus. So, you know, 10 years ago, it seemed like the problems were a long way off. Uh, but two things have happened. One, um, governments have used an enormous amount of dry powder that existed. Uh, both in fighting the pandemic recession and in engaging in huge social policies after the recession, after the pandemic recession. And two, uh, we're starting to really come up against the deadlines for entitlements. So mm -hmm. the Medicare hospital insurance trust fund is going to run out of money in 2030. And if we don't change policy, it'll have an 11% cut to, ta uh, to benefits. And Social Security in 2033. And if we don't change policy, it'll have a 22 or 23% cut to benefits, mm -hmm. right? So we're starting to come into these deadlines uh, in the very near future, which is mi which is going to serve to really focus energy on on paying attention to this stuff. Mm -hmm. If we if we don't change policy uh, and interest rates stay around three percent, then by the middle of the century, well over a third of all tax revenue will go to paying interest on servicing the debt. Mm -hmm. 
right? Which leaves not as much left mm -hmm. for defense, not as much left for social security, not mm -hmm. as much left for anything else that we would like to do with government. If and by the way, that's with a baseline of interest rates being at like 3%, right? If interest rates stay at 4%, it's gonna be about half of the, in half of the revenue goes to servicing the debt. And if interest rates settle in around 5%, it'll be almost two thirds, right? Mm -hmm. So we are running into a funding crisis where we need to dramatically reshape the US government either on the revenue or the expenditure side. Entitlements have to be a significant part of that because those are the main driver of mm -hmm. these problems. And as long as the US remains paramount in international funding markets, um, you know, we can keep pushing this can down the road and just running the debt to GDP number up and up and up, as Japan was doing, as has been doing, as, as Constance emphasized. Um, but we're a little bit different from Japan in the sense that we're a net current account deficit country, mm -hmm. meaning that we rely on foreigners to fund our borrowing binges, right? And if foreigners decide to be less willing to finance those deficits, either for geopolitical reasons, because you know China and Russia, you know, hate freedom or they hate us, or <laughs> they just want to destroy the international order so that they can play more games in their backyards, or whatever reason that it is, you know, and and other countries become less willing to finance our deficits because the debt dynamics just look worse and worse and they prefer to be in gold or euros or some other competitor that I can't imagine right now, a crypto invention or who knows what, uh, you know, AI credits uh, for AI machines it could become the reserve asset for all I know. Um, you know, then you run the risk that, uh, you know, that we have to pay more and more and more and the dollar goes down and it creates this self-reinforcing uh, mm -hmm. negative cycle, which will be familiar to Latin American investors mm -hmm. when you wind up borrowing in foreign currencies or when Correct. foreigners become become unwilling to finance your current account deficits. Um, and so that international element is really the critical the critical key. Um, at present, there's no competitor to the US as you know as you're pointing out. And and you know without that competitor to the US Treasury note to the US dollar, it means we can keep kicking the can. Mm -hmm. But on a 20 year horizon, I can't be sure that no competitor will emerge or that the debt dynamics get so bad that even without a competitor, we just go into a fractured international financial system without a dominant hegemonic reserve asset. Yeah, thank you for that, Steve. And, and, and if, if you look at what the IMF has put out since Marrakesh, they, they noted that since the US put sanctions on Russia, China looked at that and said, hey, maybe we should diversify because clearly we're outside of the friend zone here. And so when you look at Chinese holdings of treasuries, they have been in trend decline. And that is not a good timing when you have what almost 9% fiscal deficits, treasury having to, having to issue, and you have interest payments as a percentage of GDP almost doubling in the past year. Um, but talking about China, and this is gonna be our final question. Thank you all very much. Let's go to you, Constance, on China, because I find China fascinating. It can be, you know, everybody's favorite in the market, and then it can be uninvestable. Right now, the zeitgeist is China is uninvestable. And if you even talk about investing in China, you hate humanity. You're, you, don't, you don't like human rights. Oh, come on, guys, there's a price for everything. So my question is, China, okay? So China has been completely devastated in inequity, mar inequity markets. Um, let me ask you on, on both fronts, market and economics. Economy, where is it going? And is China due for a relief rally because it has been so devastated? So I have a fascinating statistic on China. Um, China is the only economy in the whole world that where their employment peaked in 2015. Right, so you have other, Japan's um, population growth started declining, or um, working age population growth started to decline in 1993. Their employment has about, it's been somewhat flat since about 2017, it hasn't declined. So that's probably the worst demographic country in the world. Second worst would be South Korea. Their employment is still growing. Employment in China has been going down since 2015. It is not an economic model that works, right? Like I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. Capitalism is the it is like the co-pilot to the magic elixir, right? And and you can't. I just don't see how China's economic model is a winning model. Yes, it it pulled a bunch of people out of poverty, and yes, it, they they've done some interesting great things, and there's some interesting innovations that happen in China, although not that many because they still try to steal all of our stuff. Um, 
And so I just don't think it's an economic model that works. Now, are the things you can invest in in China where maybe you can make some money? Yes, but good luck getting that money out of China, right? China is, is going to return to exporting deflation to the world. Um, that's already happening. They have to just keep producing. There's no other way. Their model is going to implode in on itself. And I think China is going to become very much like Japan, which was the second largest economy in the world, big driver of growth. Um, part of the reason I became an economist is one of my, and an international economist was one of my best friend's father was reading a book called The Coming Economic War with Japan, right after they bought Rockefeller Center and we were afraid they were going to take us over. And it's, you know, same movie, same ending, right? It's, it, China's gonna fade from significance. Mm. I really think India is where it's at population-wise. By 2050, China's population is estimated to be 700 million people. US population is estimated to be 550 million people. That's not such a big difference, mm -hmm. right? So I am not long-term bullish on China. I've, I, I'm a member of the National Committee for US-China Relations. I'm part of the Track Two Economic Dialogues. I have been going to China for 25 years, and it's amazing I'm still allowed back in the country, but there we have it. I just don't think, I just don't think it's something that's gonna be, that's remain significant. That's not good news for Latin America, right? If well, China, they still, if need, China to they yeah, still need to import food. They still need to import food, and other um, and other countries will import from Latin America. Yeah, yeah. Well, China still remains a, a, a key export destination for um, for Latin America, um, but no, I, I thank you for, for that as well, and um, to the esteemed panelists, thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure to speak with you, and thank you all for your time. Thank you.